Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse. I'm the Copyright and OER Specialist at the Empire State College Library. The way that I became the Copyright and OER Specialist was that I was told I was the Copyright and OER Specialist. And that terrified me because I knew almost nothing about it. For a few years, I took every opportunity I could to learn what was what, reading books and articles, watching videos, taking webinars, going to conference sessions, and so forth. It was a very inefficient self-study, and I'd like to make things easier for you. You're probably here because your library has started to do a lot more with open content and open educational resources, and you want to know what's what and how to. What you're going to get is the condensed version of what I taught myself over the years. I'll start with the background of what exactly is open content in the Creative Commons. Then we'll move on to what the Creative Commons licenses are and what they do. Then we'll go over what they make possible and what they don't allow. And finally, what can you do as a librarian to help the faculty, staff, and students find, use, and create open educational resources? Before we can talk about Creative Commons, we need to have a background in the way copyright law works for education, including online distance learning. The first half of it is that copyright protects any work of original authorship, which means any genre of communication at all, as long as it has some tiny element of the author's creativity. So, a list of items off the cafeteria menu is not copyrightable. But if you were to describe the items or rate them, that would be copyrightable because you've put your original ideas into it. The other half of copyright is that the work of original authorship has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That means that it doesn't matter what format or delivery method it's in. It just has to be set down in some sort of record. So if it's written down, it's copyrighted. Saved to a disk, saved to the cloud, recorded on vinyl, recorded on film, etched in stone, woven in fabric, it's copyrighted. Copyright is often signaled by the phrase, all rights reserved. The rights that are reserved are the right to make copies, distribute copies, either for profit or not, and also to make and distribute derivative works. The final right that's reserved to the copyright owner is the right to transfer ownership of the copyright to another person permanently or to grant another person a license to make and distribute copies or make and distribute derivative works. There are several exemptions to copyright that apply to teaching and learning, which are educational use, fair use, the TEACH Act, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Educational use allows performance and display of copyrighted works in a face-to-face -face classroom setting only. It doesn't allow anything online, and it doesn't allow making copies for handouts or e-reserves. Fair use is the catch-all copyright exemption. It's complicated and vague. Fair use protects uses that would normally be considered infringing, except that the government considers those kinds of uses beneficial to society. The socially beneficial uses are education, criticism and commentary, news reporting, a single copy for personal use, and creating transformative works. To be considered a fair use, your use of the content needs to pass what's called the four-factor test. Ideally, your use will be 1. For a purpose that is considered socially beneficial. 2. The content you use will be published nonfiction. 3. You'll only use a little piece of the work and it won't be the heart and soul of the total work. And 4 you'll use it in a way that doesn't negatively impact the market for the original work or any derivative works that the copyright owner might eventually want to create. Even if you blow it on one of the four factors, or are kind of iffy on two of the factors, it might still be fair use, because what matters is the overall picture. The problem is that we do more and more teaching and learning online, and that allows for cheap, easy, instantaneous copying and sharing of content. That pretty much destroys our chance of looking good on that fourth factor, effect on the market for the original work. So fair use is more difficult and risky online. Some people don't consider it worth the risk, and publishers and the Copyright Clearance Center will encourage you to believe them. The law says that fair use is possible online, but you need to weigh the risk for yourself on a case-by-case -case basis. The next bit of copyright leeway for educators is the TEACH Act. Within the TEACH Act's extensive limitations, educators can embed copyrighted multimedia in online courses in cases that, the f that fair use might not protect. If you fulfill the requirements and restrictions of the TEACH Act, 
It allows performance and display of copyrighted items within a course in a learning management system that are directly analogous to what would go on in a face-to-face -face classroom. The TEACH Act doesn't pertain to reserves or e-reserves. It doesn't allow derivative works, and it doesn't allow anything to take place outside of a password-protected course that only students enrolled in the course have access to. The last bit of relevant copyright law is the DMCA, which isn't about what we're allowed to do. It's about what can happen to us if we're caught violating copyright. Basically, the copyright owner or their agent contacts a designated officer at the college, and the page or site with the infringing content is taken down without warning. There is recourse. You can put your site back up, but then you could personally be going to court for a lawsuit and or criminal charges. The DMCA offers the college as an institution some protection from liability when faculty, staff, and students infringe in exchange for complying with DMCA takedowns. So copyrights exemptions for education, scholarship, criticism and commentary, and transformative works are not enough to let us freely share and remix all the content we want to share and remix with other scholars and with our students. When it comes down to it, there's no legal way to give our students access to other people's intellectual property in the form of textbooks without having them pay for them, and the cost of textbooks is high and rising. And there is no legal way to give ourselves and our students access to other people's intellectual property in the form of scholarly literature without having to pay for it, mostly through library subscriptions. And we're all acutely aware that those costs have pinched library budgets and are only getting worse. The problem is that other people's intellectual property belongs to them or to publishers and vendors, and what they choose to do with that ownership is restrict the terms under which we can use it and make it super expensive. The solution is finding and creating content that bypasses that publishing economy. We can create a second parallel information economy of textbooks, scholarly literature, learning objects, even art, that are still intellectual property but are made available under more liberal terms and at no cost. This solution comes from the man in the picture, Dr. Larry Lessig. He's a scholar, a copyright lawyer, and the founder of the Creative Commons. So the Creative Commons is a system of licenses that copyright owners can opt into. Each license delineates what rights the copyright owner is reserving for themselves, such as the right to be attributed as the original author of the work, or the right to prohibit commercial and for-profit uses of the work. And the license also spells out the rights that the copyright owner freely grants everyone else, such as the rights to make and share copies and create derivative works. In addition to being a system of licenses, the Creative Commons is a tool that allows copyright owners to create metadata about those rights that they can embed into the work so that it's searchable as open content and also so that the user will be able to see what they're permitted to do with the work and what they're not permitted to do. Creative Commons doesn't bypass copyright, it works within it. The author of a Creative Commons work still owns the copyright. They've just given everyone a blanket license to use the work in certain ways under certain conditions, without having to ask permission or pay anything. The result is that more and more content is being created and put out there in a gift economy that operates in the midst of the economy of publishers and vendors, but independent of it. A gift economy is an economy where things of value are exchanged without any expectation of direct financial compensation. In a gift economy, compensation may be loosely defined, and it comes from something other than profit. Compensation may take the form of access to a larger audience, an enhanced reputation in the community, participating in a system that gives you access to more content that you can use more freely, or just good feelings of belonging to a community and doing good in the world. It can be all of the above. The generic word for this kind of intellectual property is open content. Open content can be any topic, format, genre, or delivery method art, music, books, textbooks, reference books, articles, videos, podcasts images, games, quizzes, mini-lectures, whatever. Because we're in higher education, the kind of open content we'll end up working with the most is Open Educational Resources, or OER. Open Educational Resources include everything from whole courses down to extremely granular learning objects, like a chart or a quiz. 
Open textbooks are a specific subset of open educational resources. There are several kinds. Some open textbooks are just ebooks with a Creative Commons license so that they can be copied and distributed for free without permission. These textbooks are written, reviewed, and edited using the same model as traditional textbooks, except that they're Creative Commons. Others are more than just static text and images. They have multimedia and interactive components built in, like the online supplementary materials for a traditional textbook, except fully integrated. Then there are modular open textbooks that allow the faculty member to mix and match in adopting modules and combine different modules from different sources to create a custom textbook from the for the course. Modular open textbooks make it easy for the faculty member to edit and adapt, adding in images, switching out case studies, creating assignments using local resources, and so forth. The modules are still authored and reviewed by experts. There is central editing and oversight, and no matter what changes the faculty make to a module, the original stays the same. And then there are the hairy radical open textbooks on the fringe. This is the Wikibooks model of open textbooks, where anyone can contribute, anyone can review or edit, and there's no stable official version. That scares a lot of people, but it can be very useful to have your students compose their own textbook in this way. Also, some professional communities of practice create manuals and reference guides for, guides for themselves in this way. So to sum up the types of open content that we and our teaching colleagues are likely to encounter, open educational resources, or OER, are learning objects, everything from a course down to a single granular item. One type of OER is open textbooks, some of which are books as we know them, and some of which are more, much more modular, fluid, and flexible. Then there are open access articles. Despite their name, they're not open content, but I'm going to talk about them anyway because people connect the two in their minds, and they really are natural allies. Open access articles are scholarly articles that the user, either the individual reader or the library acting on their behalf, doesn't have to pay to read. Open access articles are either located online in open access journals, or they're published in regular journals, and the authors get permission from the journals to archive them online in repositories. Open access articles, whether in journals or in repositories, are absolutely free to access, and because of that, they can lower barriers to and reduce the costs of higher education, just like open educational resources do. But you can't copy them, share them, or create derivative works from them, and that's why they're not open content. As warm and fuzzy as we might feel about the idea of content that's free to the user and available to share, adapt, remix, etc., you never get something for nothing. Information and creativity are hard work and require resources. We need to know who pays for it and how. What's non-negotiable about open content is that we minimize the barriers to use because we want to encourage use, so the user never pays directly for the content. So who does pay for the writing, peer review, formatting, and publication of the content? There are a couple answers to that question, and they're not mutually exclusive. I feel like I've thrown cold water on any enthusiasm for open content by pointing out right away that there are significant costs. Moving towards OER and adopting, adopting open textbooks is not going to solve the higher education cost crisis. But we should also acknowledge that there are huge efficiencies to harness in the world of open content. Many faculty and staff are already creating a great deal of content as part of their work. The costs are already sunk into that content. It isn't the kind of content that authors ever expected to make a profit on, so there's nothing to lose by making it open. And if we do, the academic community can amplify and share the other kinds of return on investment. Librarians and instructional designers and faculty are already making tests, games, activities, mini-lectures, and videos. When we turn those into open educational resources and release them into the wild, others can use them and build on them instead of reinventing the wheel over and over again. And in turn, we get to take advantage of the learning objects that were created by others, rather than putting our time and effort into making something that someone else has already made. One of the great things about open content is that if you have a little niche area of expertise, you can share that niche with a much bigger and more far-flung population. The other side of that is that you can take advantage of those specialty niches of colleagues that you may never even meet. And here's a big advantage compared to using conventional intellectual property. 
where even if you're allowed to use the content, you have to keep it as is. With most Creative Commons licenses, you can adjust and adapt the content to suit your local needs. If it's in the wrong language or format or intended for the wrong age group or audience, or if you want to add images or case studies, that's all fine as long as you abide by the requirements of the license. A few months ago, I was talking to a group of Empire State College faculty about open educational resources. One of them asked, but how can we be sure it will always be there? Things on the internet just disappear. Another major advantage of open educational resources is that because you're allowed to make and share copies freely, you can go ahead and archive your favorite version of it wherever you want and make sure that it stays available forever. You may be wondering about what the difference is between free resources and open resources. And even if you know the difference, many of your colleagues are still confused. Free resources are available at no cost. You don't have to pay to access them, but if you want to make copies, make derivative works, or perform and display them, you will need to ask permission, and usually that will cost money. Open content is also free to access. The difference is that you don't need to ask permission or pay anything to make and distribute copies. Additionally, in many cases, you can also create and share derivative works without asking permission or paying. Content on the open web is free. Some of the free content on the web that's especially useful to academics includes open access scholarly journal articles and videos on TeacherTube, Vimeo, TED Talks, and so forth. While it's free to access it yourself or send your students to it, you can't download a copy of the file and upload it to your online course or email it to your students. All you can do is share a link. With open content, you can copy and share the content itself, not just a link to it. But you have to cite and link back to the original, and in some cases, you can't make derivative works. As I mentioned a few slides ago, open content doesn't require the user to pay anything to access or use the content. It's good for preservation, because there are no legal barriers to applying the lots of copies keep stuff safe principle by hosting your own copy of the content. And also, most open content lets you harness the expertise and hard work of others while customizing and adapting their content for your local needs. But this is the real world, so for every upside, there's a downside, and for every savings, there's a cost. If you want to use open content, first you have to find it, and that takes time. Usually, it takes less time than it would take to create the content yourself, but if a faculty member already has a textbook or a learning object that they like, they may be reluctant to put more effort into finding, evaluating, and customizing a new one. Another cost is that although in theory you can always make and host your own copy of a resource, not everyone has the infrastructure or technical support to actually do it. Finally, for all that traditional content publishers and vendors put a lot of restrictions on reuse and often charge too much for us to afford, they provide services that we sometimes need. They're absolutely brilliant at packaging the content. They make it easy to find and convenient to use the content, at least in the ways that they approve of. The other thing that traditional publishers and vendors do is act as gatekeepers, keeping out low-quality content. And they also provide stringent quality control on the content they do admit. They're far from infallible, but we have come to rely on them. Some open content has quality control mechanisms too, including traditional peer review in some cases, and open peer review in other cases. But there's always hesitation to rely heavily on a new model until it's been proven. And it is true that there's plenty of open content out there that has not been vetted and isn't up to academic standards. Then again, there are so-called scholarly journals and textbooks that fall short too. Regardless of the quality control, it will always have to be up to the individual librarian or scholar to evaluate the content. Now that you know the pros and cons of open content, I want to talk about Creative Commons licenses themselves. Having a Creative Commons license is the most important and non-negotiable thing that makes something open content. The simplest Creative Commons license is the Attribution License, and here you can see the logo for it. The shorthand for it is CC BY. Its only requirement is crediting the author. As long as you give credit to the author and link back to the original, you can make copies, share those copies, make derivative works, and share the derivative works. All of the other Creative Commons licenses require attribution, and they add other requirements on top of that. The second kind of Creative Commons license is Attribution Non-Commercial, or CC BY NC. 
Under this license, you need to cite and link back to the original, and then you can copy it, share the copies, and make derivative works, but only if you are not making any money off of it. You can't sell it or use it for any money-oriented purpose. Educational activities in a nonprofit institution like SUNY are absolutely fine, but not all college-related activities are considered educational or nonprofit. The non-commercial license is one that people use when they want to retain the ability to profit from their own work for themselves, while letting others use it in a non-commercial way if they want. It's also good for authors who want to share their work and make sure that it's never commercialized at all. The next kind of Creative Commons license is Attribution No Derivative Works, or CC BY ND. If a work has this kind of license, you need to give proper attribution and link back to the original. Then you can copy it and share the copies, but you can't create any derivative works. That means no spin-offs, sequels, supplementary materials, remixes, mashups, translations, updates, or adaptations into a new format. The reason people might want to use this kind of license is to protect their moral rights to a work. Some of the faculty I've talked to are very concerned about the learning objects they create being ripped out of their original context or altered in a way that would reflect poorly on the original creator. So for them, the No Derivative Works license allows them to share their work without worrying about it being misused or made to say something they never intended to say. The fourth kind of Creative Commons license is Attribution Share Alike, or CC BY SA. Under Attribution Share Alike, you can copy the work, share the copies, and make derivative works, as long as you put the new work under the same kind of license. Nobody seems to be sure if it's okay to take content that's CC BY SA, create a derivative work from it with its own CC BY SA license, and then lock up that derivative work behind a password. Some people say it's all right as long as there's a freely available version too. Other people say that's not explicitly allowed by the license, so you shouldn't do it. The point of the Sharealike license is to spread and grow the Creative Commons. Most of the people I've talked to seem to think that you should avoid a Sharealike license if you're going to use the content within a password-protected learning management system. So it should only be used on the open web. Next, we get into Creative Commons licenses that combine multiple restrictions. An attribution, non-commercial, share-alike license requires that you cite the original creator of the work, not make any money from using the work, and put any of your own derivative works under the same license. An attribution, non-commercial, no derivative works license requires that you cite the original creator of the work, not make any money from using the work, and only use the work as is. You can't adapt it in any way. So that takes care of the licenses, and having a Creative Commons license is the one basic thing that is absolutely necessary for something to be open content. But there's usually more to it than that. Unless you're talking about a no derivative works license, the license allows people to adapt and remix the content. That could mean anything from converting it to a format that's more accessible to, for disabled learners, to translating it, to adapting it for a new context, to creating something entirely new with it. Unless you make the source file available in a way that can be edited, you're putting up barriers to the exact kind of reuse that you're supposed to be encouraging. So it's considered almost mandatory to put open content out there with its source file available and in an open format. When I say the source file has to be available, I mean that, for example, if your video is on YouTube, you also have to provide a link to the MP4 file that you put on YouTube or at least be willing to email users a copy of it if they contact you for it. That way they can edit it into a form that's useful to them. And an open format is the opposite of a pro proprietary file format. Basically it means that the user doesn't need to purchase software that might be too expensive for them to afford, or not even available in their part of the world, in order to edit the file. The standards for open file formats are available to everyone, so anyone can create a piece of software that works with the open file formats. As an example, Microsoft .doc files are proprietary. .text and .pdf files are open. The reality of the situation is that I create Flash files with Adobe Captivate and put them on YouTube with a Creative Commons license, and I still call them OER. The reason for that is that I don't have the freedom to install other software on my work computer. This is true for many of us. If you can use open file formats, do it, and provide access to your source file. 
If you can't, just do what you can. There are plenty of people out there who promote a very idealistic, rigorous idea of open contact, and I think they're doing important, necessary work. But you don't have to be orthodox to make a real difference. I've created a page that lists various free tools you can use to create OER. Some of them are web-based, and others need to be downloaded and installed. Some of them are open source, others are not. Some of them use proprietary formats like Flash, but most of them at least have the option of creating files in an open file format. I hope to keep updating and expanding this list, so if you come across any tools that aren't on it, please use the submission box on the page to suggest one. Way back there I mentioned, but sort of glossed over, the fact that open content, in order to be really open in a practical sense, has to be available and accessible. I've already addressed that the source file needs to be made available and it should be in an open file format so that it can be edited. But the other part, which is easy to forget because it's so obvious, is that people need to be able to find the piece of open content to begin with. You can have a great OER with a Creative Commons license and a non-proprietary file format, but if it's hiding behind a password in your LMS, it's not open in any practical sense. That's why repositories are so important. Empire State College doesn't have a repository, and it doesn't look like one will be on the horizon anytime soon. A lot of SUNY campuses are in the same position. I think that's problematic, and we need to be working within our organizations to raise awareness of how important repositories are, and why, and how they need to be set up. But in the meantime, there are some big, reputable repositories that we should all be using, both to find OERs and to put our own out there. The biggest and best known OER repository is Merlot. We generally create our content with our audience in mind, and it's usually our own students. Without thinking about it, we often focus on a sort of generic, idealized student who has the ability to come to campus, do their work during the daytime, use a laptop and broadband internet, and so forth. But if we want to make our content truly open, we need to meet the needs of our primary audience while not shutting out the people on the margins. One of the most important things that we already need to be doing, whether or not we make our content open, is make our content accessible for people with disabilities. Audio resources need to have captions or transcripts. Text resources need to be in a format that screen readers can read. Resources that are heavily visual need to have textual versions for people who can't see. It's always good to start out and wrap up with a simple, concise summary of salient points for people who have issues with memory and attention. Clear transitions are good for that, too. The digital divide is another access issue. While we may think of mobile devices as auxiliary tools and mobile capabilities as the wave of the future, many poor people in this country and citizens of developing countries are using smartphones instead of computers and have been ever since they first came out. Every piece of content that we create needs to be able to work on mobile devices. We need to take into account that not everyone has broadband internet, or enough RAM to run Windows 7, or a decent video card. While we should take advantage of the technologies that are available to us, we should make sure that there are low-res versions of big files for people who need them. Even if you don't have the expertise or time to create a version that's customized for low vision people or people who use mo mobile devices, if you use an open format and make the source file available, somebody else can, and that's part of the beauty of open content. Open educational resources and open textbooks are starting to get a lot of airtime, and more and more educators are interested in making their content open. It's important to make sure that the content you're making o open is yours to do that with. If you create content in collaboration with other people, then they are co-owners of the copyright, and all the owners have to agree before you can make that happen. So if you're starting to develop a course or co-write a textbook, talk about whether it will be open very early in the project. If you want to put a Creative Commons license on content that you've already created jointly with others, you will have to get permission from all of them to do it. If you want to put a Creative Commons license on something that you've submitted to be published, you will need to have permission from the journal or publishing company. Check your contract, and if your contract doesn't allow it, there is still a slight possibility that you could negotiate an agreement. 
There's also the issue of copyrighted content, such as photographs and songs, that you used in your work, either with permission or under fair use. If your work contains someone else's copyrighted work, you will need to verify that it is still fair use or get permission from the copyright owner. Even if you got permission from the copyright owner to use their work in a closed course, you will need to get permission again if you want to make the course open. As a last resort, or just to simplify things, you can remove the content. Of course, if you've used work that's in the Creative Commons in your work, it's fine as long as it's not violating any non-commercial, no derivative works, or share-alike provisions of the license. Always double-check the license. The third consideration is whether it's a work for hire. According to the SUNY Board of Trustees, academic content, that is, courses and the learning materials that go into them, that's created by faculty and UUP staff, is not a work for hire. The intellectual property belongs to the employee who created it, unless they signed a letter of agreement stating otherwise. If it's your intellectual property, you absolutely have the right to put a Creative Commons license on it. But if you're staff and are creating content as part of your normal duties, such that it's a work for hire, or if you're faculty and did sign a letter of agreement, you can still go to your supervisor and ask for permission to put a Creative Commons license on it. If you have a piece of content that you want to make open, the most important thing to do is put it under a Creative Commons license. That's actually pretty simple. The Creative Commons organization has a quick web form that you fill out, and at the end it generates a blurb of code that you embed in your content. By now, libraries are pretty used to including open access journals in our A to Z lists. Many libraries are set up with Google Scholar so that users can log into that service through the single sign-on or proxy server, and they'll see open access articles in repositories right next to links to full text in subscription databases. One thing that we're starting to hear more requests for is help for faculty to find open textbooks and open educational resources. So I've started a libguide for that with pages listing the repositories, and of course anyone can submit a link to one that I've missed. If you want to link your faculty to our LibGuide, that's fine. Or you can create a new LibGuide using ours as a template and modify it however you like. The more we can break down the silos that separate conventionally published content from open access content and open content, the more our faculty and students will be able to find it and be willing to take advantage of it. That leads to a concern that our faculty have raised a number of times. Conventionally published content goes through a filtration process. If it's inaccurate, biased, based on poor methodology, or poorly written, we expect or at least hope that the publisher will reject it right off, or the pe peer reviewers will once they get to it. The quality control of traditional publishing isn't as monolithic and infallible as a lot of people seem to assume, but it's still better than nothing. What Open Educational Resources has for quality controls varies. Sometimes it is nothing, and evaluating quality is left entirely up to the judgment of the faculty deciding to use it. Other times, OER and open textbooks have full-on peer review, or it can be somewhere in between. The thing is that our scholarly and professional principles have never guided us to rely on the judgments of others about the quality of the materials we use for research, teaching, and learning. Using open content whose quality control hasn't acquired the same prestigious reputation as scholarly peer review under the auspices of a big-name publisher calls us back to our responsibility to judge work based on the methodology, logical coherence, the sources they cite, the quality of writing, visual communication, and so forth. When Mark McBride and I were helping build the Open SUNY course OER 101, we created a rubric for evaluating open educational resources. It's the kind of thing that's handy to have around both for yourself and for any faculty and students who come to you with questions about the quality of OERs and open textbooks. It's an everything in the kitchen sink rubric. Authority, bias, accessibility, how remixable it is. You can use the whole thing or just leave out the sections that aren't useful to you. So as I mentioned a while back, open content is not just free to access. It's also free to copy, share, and even create derivative works from. But those rights aren't absolute. They're restricted depending on which Creative Commons license you're dealing with. If you're hoping to use a graphic to market your library, that's a commercial use, even though you're a nonprofit organization. So if the graphic is under a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license, 
you will not be allowed to use it unless you contact the creator and get permission. The same goes for creating derivative works. You can print out a Creative Commons poster and hang it in your library for all to see or put it on your website. But if you want to remove the original text and replace it with something that's relevant to your library, it has to be a Creative Commons license that allows that. And most complicated of all is share alike. Basically with share alike licenses, if you're going to create any sort of derivative work, you have to be sure that you can put a Creative Commons share alike license on the derivative work and make it fully available to the public. So that kind of open content isn't really available for any kind of derivative work that would have to be password protected or restricted to a certain audience. The important thing to remember and to keep reminding faculty and students is to check the license. There are different kinds of Creative Commons licenses with different terms and you need to abide by the terms or else you void the license and you're actually violating copyright. One of the most difficult parts of suddenly being your organization's Creative Commons specialist is not knowing what to do with the role. If the organization is just starting to get active, you may not be sure where you can get a foot in the door. What I've found to be most helpful is to make connections throughout the library and the faculty and use every opportunity to insert Creative Commons into whatever is happening in a small way. Make sure that open educational resources and open textbooks are part of whatever conversation is going on. Bigger opportunities, and opportunities to create bigger opportunities, will appear once you start getting your feet wet in little ways. The other difficult part is that there's just so much to learn and remember. If you remember 10% of what I said and showed here, that's amazing. Info dumps are not an effective way to teach. But my real goal was to give you an idea of what's out there, get you interested, and then send you away with all the resources you'll need to learn in the future. I'm going to provide a copy of this presentation and a guide to the best resources for teaching yourself, open content, the Creative Commons, open educational resources, and open textbooks. One resource I'd like to highlight is Open SUNY's OER 101 online course that I worked on with Mark McBride and some non-library colleagues this past winter. It's a good introduction to the whole topic of OERs, and one of the units is all about the Creative Commons. We're building a community of knowledge and practice about OER and open textbooks within SUNY, and I think it's time we start consolidating it. Please contact me with any questions or ideas you have, and I will be starting a Google group or something for us to all stay in touch. And